Today on the Coral Ridge Hour, an inspiring message from Dr. Kennedy. If you were to descend into the caverns of the dead and call the roll, Mohammed, here. Buddha, here. Confucius, here. Zoroaster, here. Jesus, Jesus. And then a voice could be heard saying, he is not here, for he is risen, as he said. All that and more today on the Coral Ridge Hour. From Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. This is the Coral Ridge Hour. Where is the hope for America found? Throughout this nation's history, it has been in God's providence. The word providence means that God is busy in history. Find out more in the new book, The Blessings of Liberty, Hope from God's Hand in the American Journey by Dr. Peter Lilback and Dr. Jerry Newcomb. In these troubled times, seeing how God works through America's history gives powerful evidence for our gratitude and hope for the future. There's no nation ever in the history of the world that has more reason to give thanks to the Almighty than America. Contact us today to receive your copy of The Blessings of Liberty, Hope from God's Hand in the American Journey. God is involved in American history through providence. And I think that idea is still very precious to those of us that still believe in the truth of God's Word. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the first chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1, we will begin our reading with verse 1. May we hear the inspired, the infallible Word of the living God. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, 
who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son, and again when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he said, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. And may God speak to us today through this portion of his word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. Some time ago at a luncheon, a lady approached me with an interesting story and a provocative question. She said, when my son was just a young boy of 10 or 12 or 14, he decided to quit church. He didn't want to go anymore, and he hasn't gone for several decades. Now he's in his mid-30s, and something has moved on him to cause him to want to go back to church. And he asked me this question, which church should I attend? Now, he wasn't asking whether it should be Presbyterian or Methodist or Baptist, but he said Christian or Muslim or Hindu, Confucian, what church should I attend? And she was quite perplexed and said she didn't really know what to tell him. Well, I'm sure that she would be like a great many people in our country today because the politically correct thing to say would be, it doesn't matter. They're all basically the same. Like it doesn't matter which filling station you stop to fill up your gas tank. One's as good as another. There's basically no difference between them. That's politically correctness. Some of you may have noticed that I'm not particularly politically correct. <laughs> I believe it makes all the difference in the world. I believe that Christianity is not like other religions. I believe it is diametrically opposed to all of them. I believe that Christ and Christianity are unique in the true meaning of that word. Not unusual, but unique. And there's no very unique, slightly unique, more unique, is either unique or it isn't. It's the only one. And so it is with Christianity. And this has been perceived by many of the wisest people of our world, even those that aren't known for their Christian faith. For example, Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon was probably one of the most brilliant minds that this world has ever seen. He was a genius, of that I have no doubt. He unfortunately applied that genius toward conquest and destroyed tens of thousands of lives. But when, in his latter days, he was banished to St. Helena, he gave himself to the study of theology and the study of the Bible. And once he was engaged in an informal debate with one of his generals, General Bertrand, Bertrand was a complete skeptic, and Napoleon was talking about Christ, and Bertrand said, but sire, he may be all of that, he may be a great man, he may be the greatest of men, a genius, but after all, he was only a man. To which Napoleon replied, and by the way, 
I would challenge you to spend an hour reading the writings of Napoleon, and you will discover, as I did, that you find yourself in the presence of an intellect far superior to your own. And Napoleon said to General Bertrand, I know men. And I tell you, Jesus Christ is not a man. Superficial minds see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions. That resemblance does not exist. There is between Christianity and whatever other religion the distance of infinity. We may say to the authors of every other religion, you are neither gods nor the agents of deity. You are missionaries of falsehood, molded from the same clay as the rest of mortals and combining the same passions and vices as all of the rest. Your temples and your priests proclaim your origin. Now that is indeed high praise. Is it supported by the scripture? There are cultists and liberals that would say the Bible doesn't teach that Jesus is God. And unfortunately, there are many that don't know enough about the Bible to know whether that's true or not. Let me just give you a few New Testament passages. In John 1, 1, we read that in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The first sentence in the great Gospel of John, when Jesus had appeared to Thomas and showed his hands and his side after his resurrection, Thomas fell to his knees and said, my Lord and my God. The Greek is hotheos mu, the God of me, very definite. But what does God the Father say about Jesus? I read it to you today. I don't know if you detected it or not. We may hear from many other sources who he is, but the ultimate source would be, what does God the Father say? And in the first chapter of Hebrews, which I read in the eighth verse, after talking to the angels, God directs his attention, God the Father, to the Son, and he says this. This is God Almighty the Father speaking to the Son. Thy throne, O God. God is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. And this is taught in passage after passage after passage. To wit, he is the only begotten God. Christ, who is the image of God. Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Christ, who is the power of God. Our God and Lord, Jesus Christ. And there are scores more in the Bible saying the same basic thing. No, there is no doubt that the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is God the Son, the second person of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God. Now the cultists like to say that the deity of Christ and the Trinity were invented by the Council of Nicaea in 325 and that Prior to that time, none of the apostolic fathers believed that Jesus was God. Of course, they also say the New Testament doesn't teach it. We've just seen how wrong they were about that. But let's take a quick look at the earliest of all of the apostolic fathers. And that would be Ignatius of Antioch, who was born a few months before Jesus died. So he was completely contemporary with all of the apostles. And in Ignatius's letter 
to the Magnesians, the Ephesians, and the Romans, here are just some of his phrases. You see if it is true that the deity of Christ was totally unknown by the Apostolic Fathers until 325 AD. Jesus Christ our God, all of these are quotes, who is God and man, received the knowledge of God, that is Jesus Christ, for our God, Jesus the Christ, for God was manifest as man, Christ who was from eternity with the Father, from God, from Jesus Christ, from Jesus Christ our God, our God, Jesus Christ, suffer me to follow the example of the passion of my God, Jesus Christ the God, our God, Jesus Christ, and on and on and on it goes. Could anything possibly be plainer than that? The idea that the deity of Christ was invented three centuries later is utterly, to use the correct theological term, balderdash. It's a direct quote from the Greek. <laughs> but of course there are atheists today that don't believe there's any God at all. And they are particularly aggressive in our day. I remember one teacher that was vehemently atheistic and was determined to inculcate atheism in all of our students in our supposedly religiously neutral public schools. And after spending a whole year indoctrinating with propaganda the class, toward the end of the year she asked all of those who were atheists to raise their hands. Most of the students raised their hands. She said, are there any of you that are not atheists? Well, that was a most intimidating question for students in high school. One young lady rose, raised her hand and she said, you are not an atheist? She said, no ma'am, I'm, I'm a Christian. And she said, and why are you a Christian? Well, because I believe in Christ and, and my mother and father were Christians. She said, huh. And suppose that your mother and father were morons, what then? She said, well, I suppose then I'd, I'd be an atheist. <laughs> Good for her. You know, the atheists sometimes are are put out because Christians have their special days as do the Jews, but they have no special day. But somebody said, yes, you do. You've got April 1st. <laughs> the Bible says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Yes, there is a God. And that God came to earth and was born and incarnated in human flesh. And that is the first way in which Christ and Christianity are absolutely different and unique, separate from all pagan religions. No other founder of any pagan religion ever claimed to be God, nor do their followers claim it for them. Certainly Mohammed never did. Buddha was an atheist. Confucius said he knew nothing about heaven. Lao Tse, Zoroaster, none of them ever claimed to be God. Only Christ. He is unique and thus totally different from any other religion in the world. He is the only absolutely perfect person. Any other life that you examine, which you may hold in high admiration, after a while you'll see that they have feet of clay, frequently reaching to their hips, but not so with Jesus. He was the altogether lovely and perfect one. There's no sin, and did you ever think about the things that Jesus never did that we all do? I think that's interesting. He taught us to confess our sins, but Jesus never did. Jesus never confessed a single sin. We'd say, wait a minute, got you there, preacher. What about the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our debts. That is the prayer that the Lord taught, not the prayer that he prayed. He said, after this manner pray ye. If you want the prayer that the Lord prayed, you'll find the high priestly prayer of Christ in John 17. 
Also, he never apologized to anyone for anything. We've all done that a thousand times over. We need to, more than we do probably. Jesus never apologized to anyone. He had no reason to ever apologize to anyone. Furthermore, he never sought advice. The Bible says in a multitude of counselors there is wisdom. Jesus never sought advice from anyone. When it was proffered to him by his mother, he said, Woman, what have I to do with thee? When Peter tried to instruct and correct him, he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. No, in him all wisdom dwelt. Omniscience need not seek wisdom and counsel from anyone. He never asked for our prayers. Many times I've asked you to pray for me. I ask you right now again, pray for me. I am standing in the need of prayer. I need your prayers. Jesus doesn't. Never ask for prayer. Now, I, now you say, now this time I know I've got you. There in Gethsemane, the night before the cross, he, he asked the apostles to pray for him. No, he didn't. He said, wait here. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. They prayed for themselves. I don't know about you, but when things really get hard, I think most of us appreciate a little sympathy from others. We really appreciate that someone can feel our pain and sympathize with us. Jesus didn't. When it was offered to him, as he was winding his way down the Via Dolorosa, the dolorous way to the cross, with the cross to Calvary, you recall that the street was lined with the women of Jerusalem, and they were weeping and lamenting him. Jesus stopped that ghastly parade and turned to these women and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, Weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and your children, for if they do this in a green tree, what shall be done in a dry? Four decades later, as the armies of Titus and Vespasian encircled Jerusalem, and thousands and thousands of men were crucified, and hundreds and thousands of others died of starvation, he knew what happened in a dry tree, and they learned it as well. Jesus doesn't need our sympathy because Jesus wasn't a martyr. As many liberals and unbelievers like to think that he was a martyr to a cause, Jesus said this, no man taketh my life from me. For I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. He could have in an instant called down 20 legions of angels. He could, by a blink of his eyes, have swept all of his tormentors into hell. He is the omnipotent one and does not need our sympathy. We should sympathize for ourselves and for our children and pray that they will come to know him as Lord. So the first way in which Christ is absolutely unique is that he is God, the altogether perfect one who has been incarnated into this world, and that is absolutely different than any pagan religion. Secondly, he is unique in that he died for the sins of the world. Buddha died for no one's sins. He lived to be 70-some and died naturally. So did Confucius. Muhammad died as an old man in his bed, attended by one of his many wives. And so it was true of Zoroaster and all of the rest. Only Jesus died for the sins of the world. May I further say this? I sincerely doubt that any founder of any other religion ever even contemplated for a moment 
the idea that they could die and pay the penalty for the sins of the world. I would further go so far as to say this. I do not believe that any one of you has ever in your life had this thought. Now you'd think that I were omniscient to make a statement like that. Have I listened to all of your thoughts? No, but I'm sure I'm right. You have never entertained the thought that you could die and pay for all of the sins of the world. Dear friends, that is, is unthinkable. No, Jesus trod the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God alone. There was no one to join him, no one to take even a sip of that cup with the distillation of the sin of the world that was held before his face at Gethsemane and which he took to his lips on Calvary. And when Jesus Christ, the altogether sinless one, became sin. And the infinite wrath of the almighty creator of the universe was poured out all on him. That is absolutely unique. Thirdly, Christ is unique because he is the only founder of any of the religions of the world that rose again from the dead. I've been to the tombs of many of the great of this world, and one thing I've discovered, they're all occupied, <laughs> except the tomb of Christ. I've been there many times, walked around in it, prayed in it, examined it carefully, it is empty. Only the tomb of Christ. If you were able to descend into the great cavern of the dead and call the roll call of the great, you would hear something like this. Buddha, here. Mohammed, here. Confucius, here. Zoroaster, here, Jesus, 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 he is not here, for he is risen as he said. I am he that was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And he that believeth on me shall never, ever die. Not only did he rise from the dead, but he arranged it in a certain way that the resurrection of Christ becomes the greatest, best proved fact in all of history. Our faith rests upon the Gibraltar of the resurrection, and that cannot be shaken. Consider Dr. Matthew Arnold, professor of history at Oxford University, who also wrote massive tomes on the Roman Empire. Dr. Arnold said this, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the best proved fact of history. That should comfort you to know that the professor of history at Oxford University says that what we trust in for our eternal hope is the best proved fact of history. Or Lord Lindquist, the Solicitor General of the British Empire, the highest legal position in Great Britain, and he said this, quote, I know something about evidence. <laughs> That's got to be one of the understatements of all time. And I can tell you that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
is better and fuller of every sort than any other fact of history. To sum up, what shall we say? First, let me say this. I want you to remember this sermon. In fact, I will guarantee that you will remember it. How many outlines of how many sermons in the last year can you come up with right now? You will remember this one. An empty boast? Not at all. I've even arranged some mnemonic stimuli. We call them Christmas, Good Friday, and Easter. On Christmas, we celebrate that God was incarnate in human flesh and born in a stable. On Good Friday, we celebrate that God in human flesh was skewered to a cross and endured the wrath of his Father for our sins. And on Easter, we celebrate the glorious appearance of Christ back from three days in a tomb as the God-man conquering death. Yes, those reminders of the points of my outline will be with you every year for the rest of your life. You will not forget the outline of my sermon today. And if we were to sum it all up, what do we get? Well, every Christian knows that we are saved by faith in Christ. And I hope every one of you knows that. Not by any works which we have done, but by faith in the incarnate, crucified, and risen Christ. And therefore, if we ask, why is it that we are saved by faith? I think we, I might shake a few of you off. The answer to that is that we are saved by faith in order that we may be saved by grace. But if then I continued to inquire as to why is it, why is it that we are saved by grace? I'm afraid I'd shake off a lot more. Do you know why is it that we are saved by grace? Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield was professor of theology at Princeton about a hundred years ago. He was a great ornament of Princeton, considered with Augustine and Calvin one of the three greatest theologians that ever lived. A brilliant, brilliant mind. And he said, the essence of Christianity, the essence of Christianity, which separates it from every pagan religion whatsoever. The essence of Christianity is that salvation is of God. Every pagan religion teaches the same thing. Salvation is of man. Now, dear friends, if that's not unique, I don't know what is. From eternity to eternity, he said, from Alpha to Omega, salvation is of God. It was God that was incarnated. It was God that was crucified. It was God that rose from the dead. Salvation is of faith, that it might be of grace, that it might be of God. The essence of Christianity is that our hope is in God, not a God that sits up in heaven with his arms wrapped around his belly, but a God that came down and hung upon a cross to pay for our sins. That is the essence of the Christian faith. Is it yours? Do you know that the Almighty God has redeemed you? Have you come to hear the marvelous music of his voice? Have you felt the wonders of his grace? Have you been immersed in his love? Has he changed your life? Do you know that your soul has been washed clean and white? Do you know that you have been clothed in his perfect righteousness, faultless to stand before Christ? Do you know that you have been redeemed? Today could be for you the most important day, not in your life, 
but in all eternity. You will either accept him, the Savior God, as your own, or you will continue trusting in what you are trusting in now, and I tell you exactly what that is. It is yourself. And you will do that right into hell forever. Which will it be? The God of all grace or the self of all sin? A choice is yours. May we pray. How marvelously unique, O Christ, art thou. How wondrous is the faith which you have given to us. And O oh God, by your almighty Holy Spirit, open the eyes of some that may yet be blind. Take away the hardened, stony heart and grant them a heart of flesh. May they look up unto the cross and see that there thou art dying for them. And may they invite you to come into their lives, to reside in their hearts, to cleanse them by your blood, to wash them whiter than snow, and to grant them the free gift of eternal life. Right now, in thy name, amen. Hello, I'm Rob Pacienza, Senior Pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. The Bible promises us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, but that promise is made to Christians, to those who have trusted in Christ and who have received him as Lord and Savior. It's not a promise to everyone. Have you placed your trust in Jesus Christ? Do you know for certain that you will spend eternity with him? If not, I invite you to pray this prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me. Cleanse me of my sins. Please grant me your righteousness and make me your own. Help me serve you and follow you. In your name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, you have begun a whole new adventure with Christ. And to help you grow in your new faith, we like to send you the book, Beginning Again, because that is precisely what you're doing. To receive your copy, simply write to our address or call our toll-free number. The name of the book is Beginning Again, and may God richly bless you. Where is the hope for America found? Throughout this nation's history, it has been in God's providence. The word providence means that God is busy in history. Find out more in the new book, The Blessings of Liberty, Hope from God's Hand in the American Journey by Dr. Peter Lilback and Dr. Jerry Newcomb. In these troubled times, seeing how God works through America's history gives powerful evidence for our gratitude and hope for the future. There's no nation ever in the history of the world that has more reason to give thanks to the Almighty than America. Contact us today to receive your copy of The Blessings of Liberty, Hope from God's Hand in the American Journey. God is involved in American history through providence. And I think that idea is still very precious to those of us that still believe in the truth of God's Word. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.